Good evening, everyone, citizens of Portsmouth, and I want to welcome you all to the public work session for today. November 23rd. And Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Mr. Barnes. Mr. Battle. Mrs. Lucas Burke. Present. Mr. Moody. Here. Dr. Whitaker. Present. Mr. Woodard. Here. Mayor Glover. Here. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir. Now it is my honor and privilege to welcome uh, to our work session our esteemed General Assembly leaders. I'll start with the most senior. Uh, our state senator, Senator L. Louise Lucas, thank you, Senator Lucas, for being here today. My pleasure to be here, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And also, Delegate Don Scott, want to welcome you for being here, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Pleasure and to see everybody in person again. Yes, sir. <laughs> and um, I think Mr. Clark might be joining us, Delegate Nadarius Clark. On behalf of the City Council, I want to thank all of you for being here and looking forward to a very engaged discussion. We also have with us Ms. Sherry Neal, who is our legislative team member here in the City of Portsmouth. And so, Ms. Jones, would you please proceed with the items? Thank you. Tonight is our annual joint meeting <coughs> with the Portsmouth City Council and members of our Virginia the purpose of this meeting is to receive input from our legislators regarding the upcoming general assembly session, to discuss the city's legislative initiatives, and secure sponsors for the upcoming general assembly session. Prior to Ms. Neal, at this time, I would like if I, any of our delegation to speak to the political landscape or anything you want to share at this point, uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you, City Ma Thank you, Man Madam Manager. <laughs> yes. Well, we had a meeting in Richmond yesterday with the uh, with Governor Ralph Northam and Governor Elect Youngkins and Governor Elect, no, not Governor Elect, but Lieutenant Governor Elect Winston Sears. And each of us had an opportunity to go around the table to talk about uh, our forecast for the upcoming session of the General Assembly. And one of the things that I shared with them is that uh, as they were speaking somewhat, a little bit doom and gloom some, I was telling that in the Hampton Roads region, employment is forecast to grow 3.1%. Uh, and of course, that's faster than the growth for the state, which is, as you all know, is 1%. And the gains are largely driven by growth in professional and business services, trade, transportation, and utilities, and leisure and hospitality employment. Of course, you all know hospitality is coming back. Uh, therefore, I'm optimistic on the outlook for employment and income growth. New investments in, uh, at the port will also drive just additional job growth. Last month, Governor Northam announced the Siemens Gis, uh, Gamesi, yeah, Renewable Energy, uh, which will establish the first offshore wind and turbine blade facilities in the United States and at the Ports Marine Terminal. Terminal. The facility will create a total of 310 new jobs with a total investment of $200 million. I noted that uh, in our region, a risk to this outlook is the lack of available and affordable child care as it is impacting the ability of women to return to the workforce. Women provide a disproportionate share of child and elder care, as we all know. Another risk is related to the tolls that have unequal parallel on low-income workers. Now, I appreciate what the uh, recent efforts are of the governor to increase annual funding for toll relief program to more than $3 million. But what I indicated to them is that that's just the first step. You all heard me when I said we have a long, long way to go. 
Uh, however, my ultimate goal uh, of the tolls on the downtown mid -tunnel, tunnel is to eliminate them altogether. And uh, I'm just uh, more optimistic uh, this year uh, to the fact that the growth in multiple sources of revenue has been strong. But I do urge caution through, uh, though based on risk that include a possible resurgence of COVID-19, inflation, supply chain disruption, workforce labor market factors, and uh, continued uneven recovery from certain industries. But other than that, that's my forecast for going into the next, into the 2022 session. Yes, please. I don't, I don't want to belabor the points that the Senator made. I'm just going to hit on a couple of quick items real quick. I think uh, one of the challenges that we're going to con continue to, to work on, and I know the Senator and others are still focused on that, is making sure that we protect our public schools. Uh, we are hearing that um, the governor-elect may want to take a look at uh, creating charter schools. Right now, uh, every locality can create a charter school right now. They just, where do they get the money from? You have to get the money from, from the public school, from our, our funding. So, so we need to be very careful about uh, making sure that we protect public schools and stay away and stay aware of, of this whole idea around creating charter schools because we know that takes funding from public schools. That's one. And then the second issue is um, this uh, this idea of some tax cuts. I know uh, Governor Northam uh, last couple a year and a half or so ago he gave a tax cuts to single uh, single one hundred and ten dollars to singles filing and uh, two hundred and twenty dollars to married couples. You know that's a drop in the bucket of in your home, but it sounds like uh, the governor elect wants to do something more than that. We have to also figure out where that money comes from. And there's a push talking about this grocery tax thing. I think we all need to take a look at that because as a locality, I hope city manager check and look at that because that money, those grocery taxes come straight to localities and that funds public schools. Mm -hmm. So we need to really take a look at this proposed grocery tax uh, cut because that comes directly from localities. And if those funds are not going to be replaced, then y'all need to be really paying attention to that. And hopefully uh, that's something that uh, our lobbyists and uh, our city council, city managers paying attention to because I think mm -hmm. those issues. Senator has done a great job pushing on these tolls. I've been pushing on these tolls. I think all of us have been pushing on these tolls since we've been here. Uh, we're, we're making some strides to impact those who are most affected. Uh, people making under thirty thousand dollars. I see y'all's proposal to, to raise that to forty five thousand. We both are back in that and we're introducing that legislation. Uh, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to hopefully eliminate. I introduced the bill in my first session that everybody laughed at because the body tolls back. At the time that we have these record surpluses, I think there were other priorities, but I wanted to send a message that this is a high priority for the citizens of Portsmouth, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll continue to keep our eye on the ball. ball. But I think the biggest thing that we're going to have to protect uh, this sec next section session is public education and make sure that we continue to keep an eye on workforce housing and evictions because those things are still going on. People are still being impacted by that. Thank you very much. Welcome, Delegate-elect Clark. Yes, this was an opportunity for the delegation to share any comments, insight, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, if you have anything to share, we would like to hear it at this point, or feel free to provide it later if you like. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll provide it as we go, as we hit the different points. Okay. Thank yes, you. but thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Neal to... Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, yes, Bravo, City Council, members of the General Assembly, City Manager, uh, staff. Uh, it's my pleasure this evening to present to you the City's 2022 Legislative Initiatives. We have, in our package, we have four legislative initiatives uh, for the General Assembly. We'll go briefly over those, and then I'm going to highlight some of our state public policy initiatives. Um, lastly, it will be important dates um, and the next steps, and then we'll have time for questions and answers, should there be any. So, our first initiative, and I thank Senator Lucas and Delegate Scott for the segue into this particular item. And uh, as was stated, we're very grateful for the increase in the toll relief program that was recently um, implemented and structured by, uh, supported by the governor, his administration, our legislative uh, members in the state, local officials, and so on and so forth. However, we do feel that the $30,000 income limit is still too low. It is. 
Um, so the suggestion here is to have a program developed by the General Assembly whereby the income level would be raised to $45,000 and the state would supplement that $15,000 delta with a new program providing the same <coughs> amount of uh, uh, toll relief for the same people who are under $30,000. And if it would help to make the program a little bit more palatable, the General Assembly could put a sunset on it for 2025. Um, and in that way, um, you're helping people come out of this pandemic and the current um, inflationary period that we find ourselves living in. There is a report that comes out periodically from the United Way called ALICE Report. And ALICE stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. And these are generally people who are working people with hourly jobs with little benefits. And there are um, positions such as clerks and cashiers, nursing assistants, servers, laborers, security guards, etc. <coughs> While they make more than the $30,000 cap, that $45,000 is usually what they're under. So this particular program would be very significant to this group of people. In the Alice report, it showed that for 2018 in Norfolk, out of 89,338 households, 57% were considered Alice in poverty. In the city of Portsmouth, out of 34,578 households, 57% are considered Alice and poverty at that level. So a program of this nature would be greatly welcomed and sorely needed. The next two items, uh, Portsmouth City Charter Changes, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about those, but City Council has already had public hearings on these. The public has had a chance to speak to them. They have been adopted by resolution. So the first one is going to deal with amending the charter, uh, dealing with non-interference in appointments and removals. And then the second one is a modification of the current recall provision. Our third item is the uh, amending the code 44.1146.29 semicolon 3, dealing with the Emergency Shelters Upgrade Assistance Grant Fund. This is a fund that was conceived by the City of Portsmouth, that was uh, ushered and um, marshaled by the City of Portsmouth. Senator Lucas carried the legislation for us. We were able to get it into the budget as an ongoing program. Uh, at $2.5 million. It's been capitalized at so far. <clears throat> the first uh, grant came out this year. The city of Portsmouth received $450,000 out of that grant to address the generator project at IC Norcom High School. Um, 13 counties have taken advantage of this particular grant this year. Three cities including the city of Virginia Beach and the city of Portsmouth. What we're asking here now is what we found out is that there are localities that do not own and operate their own shelters and they don't have access to this fund. So what we're asking is that this section of the code be amended to allow these localities that are in this particular situation to be able to participate in this program as well as a budget amendment to increase the program by another $2.5 million. And the last ask, ask ASK <laughs> that we have is dealing with the uh, Port Host Communities Revitalization Fund. That's another program and project that was conceived and started out of the city of Portsmouth. We carried it. Our, dele our delegation worked very hard on this, including Senator Lucas at the time. Um, and it has been increased, it started being capitalized at one million. We were able to get it increased in 2020 to by $500,000. Out of that funds in 2021, the city of Portsmouth received $500,000 and it was used to redevelop uh, a site at a 51 acre site at Lovers Point and which includes the um, BAF old chemical plant. And, and uh, did I get that right? Yes. I'm sorry. In 2020, they got 500000 for a project, power demolition, and a site clearance at Wild Duck Lane and Progress Avenue. 
In 2021, when we increased it by 500,000, we received another 500,000 for the redevelopment of the Lubbock Point site, which includes the old BAF chemical plant. The 2021 General Assembly, uh, well, let me back it up. This particular fund is a sub fund of the industrial revitalization fund which has always been traditionally undercapitalized. The 2021 General Assembly put $22.5 million of the ARPA dollars into the Industrial Revolu um, Revitalization Fund. And there was, was another $22.5 million of state general funds slated to go in the governor's budget. We didn't get any increase in our funds, so what we're looking for is to have our fund increased by another $3.5 million for a total of $5 million in that fund. Whew. Then we have our supported state public policy initiatives. I'm not going to go through each one of these individually. Um, I'll just highlight a few of them. Um, starting with the K-12 education, we are um, supporting the Board of Education's resolution that is asking to have the cap removed on the non SOQ support positions, and that would be an allocation of 387.8 million um, to do that. We are also supporting uh, uh, a legislative initiative that's being carried by the city of Hampton, dealing with the historical African American cemeteries and graves. Um, we would like to see, we are supporting them, the General Assembly, to define redefine qualifying organizations so it would allow localities that are applying for these funds under the state fund um, to address graves that are not owned by the local government but they're privately owned but they're still historic. Here we have the catalytic converters. This particular piece is being carried I believe by the city of Chesapeake and there's been a big problem with catalytic converter thefts. So what um, the ask here or we're supporting is that uh, legislation be introduced reflecting the same legislation as North Carolina recently passed relating to the felony larceny of motor vehicle parts. We also have Askania preserving and expanding tree canopies. We're supporting that local governments be provided greater authority in the reforestation, preservation, and management of urban forests, uh, and also appropriating $50 million to the Department of Forestry's Urban and Community Forest Program to enable local governments to expand and better maintain urban tree canopy. Under, under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, what we would like to see and we're supporting is expansion of electronic meetings outside of declared emergency periods with flexibility for localities to determine how to include public participation and public comment. Our next steps would be this evening the City Council is set to adopt by resolution our legislative initiatives and our package. Um, the pre-filing of state legislative initiatives began on the 15th of this month. We have a short turnaround period. Um, with pre-filing ending on the 29th of this month. Uh, next month, the governor is going to present his budget on the 16th of December, and then General Assembly is set to begin uh, January 3rd, January 12th, I'm sorry, January 3rd is Congress. And that's what we have. Questions, answers? Yes, sir. I did want to add one item. Last, last, uh, last session, Senator Lucas and I were able to get a budget amendment in for gun violence prevention in the city. We help fund one of the organizations local here. We wanted to use that as a pilot to kind of show that it could be done. There are other organizations already doing that work too. We wanted to kind of set that example and set a pilot for other localities to follow if possible. More than likely, we're going to put in another budget amendment this year. Um, hopeful, hopeful that we can get that supported by the new governor and the new leadership on the House side. I know we still, Democrats still have a Senate side, and we have a budget conferee uh, who can help us push that through, and she helped us put it through last time as well. So hopefully we can get something done this time too, because you know we still have some issues out here that we need to address. I will say this, and I, and I hope, you know, one of the things that I wanted to say is I, I follow, because I do a lot of justice reform, and a lot of times we do that, people push back and say crime's up. Even though we, we have a, we got like a battered women's syndrome sometimes, and plus we beat ourselves up more than others. 
if you talk to the police and you look at the data, our numbers are down. Mm -hmm. Our numbers are down. The murder rate is up by one percentage. We got one more murder this year to date than we did last year. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we're coming at the end of the year. But our property crime numbers are down. Our violent crime numbers are down. And so we got to come times, you know, we got to take yes for an answer sometimes. Sometimes things are working in the right direction. We still got to do a lot of intervention in our, with our children, youth, youth, the violent, the, the juvenile stuff. But I think we have some programs in place. There are a lot of community-based organizations that are getting engaged. There's seven or eight of them that I can think of off the top of my head and hope we will be able to get some state funding to continue to pilot and help shepherd that lawn and they could be a force in the community for change. And I just wanted to add that. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Scott. And I did not point that out, but that is one of our initiatives to support any gun violence preventions through community prevention programs. So we're definitely supporting that issue as well. For the, um, well, you know, I, I chair public safety uh, for finance. And to the person, everybody supported the budget amendments that we put in last year. And I think now that they understand more what the budget amendment did for the locality. As a matter of fact, when the budget when it was first put in, um, the majority of that money was not coming to Portsmouth. And um, sometimes it pays to be in the right seat at the right time. We turned that around to make sure the Portsmouth got a share. And, this, and, based, and we based it on the demographics and, and, and the rate of violent crime in those localities, which is the reason why we got more than some of the others. And so that's going to be our hard ask again this year. And now that we see that there's some fruit from the labor of what we've done, we'll be able to go back and ask for more, even though it's another administration. Those of us who sit on finance and appropriation, especially those of us who are conferees, we get to slice the last pie. So we'll make sure that we have funds in the budget to help those programs. Thank you. Delegate elect. Clark, do you have anything you want to add? Or? Um, no, everything um, so far has been straightforward, but I did just have some questions pertaining to um, trade and vocational programs for, for, for younger people to maybe help combat uh, like the violence, violent crime. A lot of times it's just lack of opportunities. Uh, so is there anything working in that way? Um, that's not one of our legislative asks. Um, I'm sh not going to speak for council, but I'm sure there's something that can be supported. And are you going to submit legislation of that nature? Are you? If it's going to help the community, I'm sure, I'm not speaking for council, but we will support. Absolutely. We're, we're going to be in support of any effort that is going to um, have an opportunity to provide resources to reduce those, those things that, you know, get our children, you know, in situations they don't need to be in. So we absolutely will be in support of those kind of measures. Thank you. Well, I'm of the opinion, and especially serving as uh, chair of education and health, I think that education is going to be a point of the sphere. And uh, in case you didn't know, my undergraduate degree is in vocational industrial education. And I have been advocating. <laughs> so I've been advocating for vocational schools or some form in our high schools ever since I've been in the legislature. And so uh, any efforts in that direction would certainly be heartwarming for me because that's from whence I come. Thank you. Dr. Whitaker, sure you have the floor. Yes, Ms. Neal, thank you for the presentation. On page five, the supported state uh, public policy initiatives, uh, this issue, uh, K-12 education, do we have any feel for, um, given that this cap has not been removed under previous administrations, what's the feel for that that would be removed during this administration? Uh, if you don't mind, Mayor That's Glover, the Councilman Whitaker, I would like our senior senator maybe to address that. Well, I know there is going to be a lot of initiatives in terms of education. You've heard a lot of those throughout the campaign. Um, anything from putting $2 billion additional funding into education for one purpose or another. But in terms of moving it, removing the cap, uh, Dr. Whitaker, it's, it's difficult to know where this administration is headed with that. But I do chair the committee. And um, I'm sure I'll have a lot to say about kinds of bills that come through my committee, as will the other members of the committee. 
Yeah. So it, it's good to be in a position where I can weigh in at least. Yeah. This um, this cap that uh, has impacted particularly uh, schools that have high poverty. Um, that that cap was instituted actually under, um, I believe, the Kane administration. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to have been a temporary measure. That's correct. And it has consistently been in place. And there are millions of dollars that uh, Portsmouth schools have lost. Forget. School has lost. Um, and so that's a that's an issue that I think that uh, a lot of attention and emphasis needs to be placed on, uh, particularly as I said, schools that have uh, very low poverty rates. When you start talking about uh, vocational uh, career and technical education these are the type of funds that if freed up could give some flexibility into putting those type of programs in place so that this this particular issue is of major importance um, to the education field I mean I, I would just add I think that's gonna always be a priority I think it was put in there to kind of have some control over the budget we have record surpluses now yeah. so whether we move that language remove it or not I mean, that's one way to fight it. The other fight is just to get them to fully fund it. That's correct. And hopefully we'll get that. We, we have a governor who's going to submit his budget soon. We'll get to see it and see where his priorities on that. And then we have an incoming governor and a new uh, House Appropriations. They, they, you know, every people, everybody says they believe in fully, fully funded education. We'll see where everybody is. I think this is one of the things that we can use. But, you know, when you take that out and that frees up, that makes money have to flow that direction above and beyond what has always been allocated. So that's kind of what the tool to put in there to kind of be a, a, a barometer and to keep things, uh, keep the speed limit down. And, but it, but we may not, we may not, we may have to you know, remove it and we'll see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Or fully funded. Or fully funded without removing it, which mm -hmm. would be the same. Mm -hmm. But it still give us the flexibility to keep it there in, in, in a down year, because we've had record uh, revenue this year, record revenue, People thought COVID was going to hurt us. We have record revenue. Yes. We had record revenue in 20, record revenue in 21. And we'll have uh, it in 22. And the projections say 22. It's, it's, been, it's been unseen based on the, the briefs that we've had, unprecedented un, un, uh, uh, revenue intakes. So there's a lot of issues, hopefully, that we can solve in the Commonwealth uh, moving forward. And that's one of them. Education is a big one. That's why I'm hoping that we'll keep our eye on the ball with public education. Mr. Battle, sir, you have to slow. Um, public education is my pet peeve as well. And um, our communities are not, I would say, hurting from our educational system. I think we're hurting um, in developing our youth from pre-K to um, high school and, and on. Uh, one need we need is to Although we have the 10 or 12 agencies that you and I can recite, we need to expand our recreational services. It'll be more effective if it's under the governmental service that these uh, agencies work. We all have to kind of pull in together, and it's important to expand those recreation dis services because as I say, the educational system is where we're failing. We're failing at the development of our youth and preparing them for the education. Um, uh, such things as uh, we don't read well at the onset. So there are simple remedies for that, such as if we don't read well, <laughs> why can't we spend uh, two to two and a half hours and reading for those students. So I think that, you know, it would be wise if we put more money in recreation as well as the other agencies and let the city govern the process. Well, uh, once we allocate or once we appropriate the funding to the locality, then we don't dictate to you how you spend it. Right. So that's up to you. That's your job. Right. To decide how you disperse those funds, and especially as it has to do with education. We don't do like the earmarks. We do it when it comes to, let's say, for example, teacher salary increases. And we allocate or appropriate a portion of our funding for. So you're saying. So you would have to match that, but otherwise, we don't earmark. We just appropriate what funding is required 
for us to send to the locality based on the composite index. We can only go by that formula. Right. So if you, so if you appropriate money for the school, we could take it and put it in recreational services. How, however you choose to use it is up to the locality. Thank we don't you. dictate to you how you do that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I know the enforcement get like $56 million mm -hmm. in all money. That's correct. So we got a big chunk of change that we you just did. recently hope. Hopefully we were able to leverage that money, especially in these, uh, you know, we got low unemployment across the Commonwealth right now. We're 1% lower than the rest of the country. Um, so we have some opportunities to get folks employed, to get them what they need, and we have some funds to help, hopefully leverage to, to impact our community. When you get $56 million that you weren't expecting at one time, hopefully you can invest that money wisely. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I want to pick it back on one thing that you said also, and that is that we are, and people talk about Portsmouth all the time, and we ought to be our best cheerleaders rather than being our best, <laughs> I don't know what word to use, but at any rate, we are in better shape than most localities all across the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Our growth is up higher than most localities in the Commonwealth. And oftentimes people will say, well, Portsmouth is in bad condition. We're not as bad off as a lot of localities in Virginia. And all you got to look at just the information we received just yesterday from the governor and the governor-elect. That information, the data is there. And what you hear people espousing is just not correct. It, it just absolutely is not correct. The city manager can tell you the same thing. And we are worse critics. We are better off than most. Well, that I know. Mm -hmm. I'm the biggest cheerleader for our city. Mm -hmm. I know how um, we are the state of the union and our potential. Our potential is off the chart. And I've been trying to uh, explain that to our citizens. And I think they're catching on. We're, we're, we're at a pretty good place right now, yes. believe it or not. Councilwoman Lucas Berkman, right. you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Neal, for the presentation and your comments, um, Senator Lucas, Delegate Scott, Delegate Clark. Uh, uh, as a member of the Virginia First Cities, uh, where we went um, this year, we do have a lot of localities advocating for um, this. K-12 education um, piece with the uh, supporting the cap. Correct. Um, so out of those localities that are involved, just want you to know that it's not just Portsmouth pulling uh, for this, but 20 some other localities that we have in our own Virginia First Cities um, legislative packet and it has the same information here. Um, and they are encouraging the General Assembly um, to use the funds that they have uh, to support the cap and also to create an equity fund which will add and at risk add on uh, to provide additional resources for uh, teachers, uh, salaries, and other uh, things that are needed for the S uh, SOQ. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Councilman, Councilman Moody, sir. I'm, I'm going to go back to what the uh, Senator, Senator Lucas said about it, that many times we're our own worst detractors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that comes about saying that we can't do something because we're economically disadvantaged. It, it is an easy way to tell somebody, no, you don't support their uh, project or, or don't support funding their particular cause. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it may be the easy answer, but it's not the true answer. It's not true. And, and I think that uh, serves to... Uh, denigrate our, our city uh, throughout the state, throughout the nation. And, and, and we need to get away from that. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. But th thank each of you for your presentations. You're welcome. Councilmember Woodard, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Neal, I appreciate your presentation once again. Uh, I just want to jump back into the, uh, the tow uh, solutions that we are looking at. Um, I, I, like I said, we put in a resolution, I guess, for to uh, expand this to 45,000. Is this actually the same program that we had before when um, I guess our commuters uh, get a cheaper rate going through the tunnel or whatnot? Because uh, I, I think the main thing, the things that I've been getting calls on, is actually the bills that they occurred as well. So is there any relief that we're working on to, to uh, give some of our citizens some uh, some break on you know some of the spents that occurred already? Well, if I if I could just look, this is all hindsight, of course. We've had. Um, Toll relief through two governors now. Mm -hmm. We got some toll relief through um, Governor McCull McCullough, and we got it now through Governor Northam. And even though we appreciate 
each of those steps. It didn't come anywhere near what we had asked for. As a matter of fact, I said to the city manager, not knowing that you had set a $45,000 threshold <laughs> was the one that I recommended to the governor. <laughs> it was the exact same one. Uh, it just didn't pan out this time. But we're not giving up because, as uh, Delegate Scott has already indicated, we have surplus funds that we can do some one-time initiatives on. And so uh, being a budget conferee, I'm not going to give up on the idea of maybe uh, introducing another budget amendment to ask for more relief. Uh, and as, as you recall, at the end of the session, last, last session, I got, the la I got some last minute money. Yes, you did. Last minute money. And so there's still an opportunity to do more. Uh, we just have to keep plugging away at it. Uh, because we didn't expect that I was going to get that money, that last minute money, last, last session of the General Assembly. So there's always an opportunity we can go back and dip in again. Well, I just want to let you know I do appreciate your efforts to eradicate the totals of you and Delegate Scott. Um, you know, because like you said, that's the end goal. I think Councilman Moody said it as well. You know, we are looking for relief, but we do appreciate your efforts every day. Um, just getting rid of the tolls. Really. And in spite of the tolls, we've still done better than a lot of other localities. Absolutely. In spite of the tolls. But we're not gonna we're not gonna give up. We're gonna stay vigilant. Thank you. Councilman Battle, so you have the floor. Our city is in a great position at this time. We have a wonderful strategic position and therefore a lot of businesses are attracted to our area at this time. Is there any way that we could get some funding for a transfer station and some funding to um, assist us with our uh, water supply system? I know that the bill was passed by the federal government, but I'm talking about the state government. Is there anything that you guys could do to help us? Because we're doing and exploring to see exactly what our system needs and the longevity that it might have at this point. But we know that it's an old antiquated system. And with the growth that we're having, we're going to need a transfer station. Everybody in the area has a transfer station. Well, I, hate, I hate to turn this back to the locality, but, but that's honestly where it rests. You've got those funds coming into Portsmouth, and you can use those however you choose to. I mean, you've got a, a significant $60 million, $60 million mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to do with whatever you choose. It's just, if you want to transfer first station, the money is there. It's up to you. <laughs> it's up to this council to decide what your priorities are. And I also believe, like, if y'all meet amongst yourselves, and y'all, these are the policies that y'all told us to advance this cycle. We mm -hmm. say we're going to advance every single one of them. So if you come with a different, if y'all amongst yourselves come with a different priority that y'all want us to try to fight for, obviously, that's our job. We're going to fight for y'all, whatever y'all tell us to do. That's not, hadn't been a priority presented to us. Mm -hmm. I can say this, Senator DeLucas talked about it. With this wind energy coming here, we got the water and we have the land. We're in a strategic mm -hmm. position. So we need to just continue to think about ways to leverage that. And I don't think I want to do that in this meeting, you know what I mean? Because, you know, we have some, we got to do, do this in a strategic way. But I think we got the water, we have the land, they need it, this is where they're gonna lay out to, 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 to build those, 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 uh, those, uh, those, those turbines. turbines. Mm -hmm. So we need to leverage that and I think we have time to do it. It's not too late and some of those priorities that you have around infrastructure, that's an argument to be made. I, I wouldn't make it tonight right now publicly, but I would make it behind closed doors. Well, you know, there's some things forward. that keep you awake at night, but mm -hmm. there's some things that keep me awake, but in a very nice way because I was proud to carry the, 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 the uh, wind bill, mm -hmm. and it passed. Oh, yeah. I was proud to carry the casino bill, it passed. I was proud to carry the uh, legalization of marijuana, it passed. And so we've had some successes, and, um, and I don't see them, foresee them going away. You know, I still got two more years on this term. Don't let the gray hair fool you, I'm running again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna be there to make sure, make sure some things happen. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of hard to give up being in the, in the spot that I'm in right now, because I serve on some of the best committees in the legislature, commerce and labor, finance, chair of education and health, president pro tem, doesn't get any better than that. I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. If you don't ask, you won't receive. you exactly correct. So I'm going to continue to ask, because I love my city and its citizens. Um, we have one of the oldest shipyards in the world. 
uh, we've helped this country in all the battles, and we've been successful, and we've gotten to the point we are. We've never charged taxes. Now, we appreciate all of the jobs that the folk in North Carolina and Portsmouth and Norfolk has, but is it any way that they could, uh, uh, we could work on getting a stipend, a yearly stipend from them in lieu of them not paying taxes? You're talking about the federal government? Yes, ma'am. That's one you're going to have to take it with Mark One and Tim Kane. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. Anyway, I got one, one more question. Uh, this is in your PowerPoint, um, Ms. Neal. Uh, dedicated transit funding for HRT and uh, statewide transit needs. Um, is, can we expound on that a little bit more? Um, you, that was I, my bill, too. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> well, well my, my thing is, you know, I know we got the casino coming, and, you know, that'll be a... a, a business district in the future and we also got our thriving uh, waterfront area you know um, if when you ride around Boston, when you look around you see you know tra train tracks is not being in use anymore you know um, you know I, I know it's not the most state-of-the-art thing but um, is there any way for us to um, in the future you know just just build on some type of a tie for, for Portsmouth to try to connect those two business districts you know it may not be nothing at a you know, service the whole area, but it could be something to join those two business districts together. Uh, you know, the uh, casino area and also the waterfront. I, I think it's a, a excellent idea. We got tracks to go all the way down here, but you know, we don't we don't have any uh, you know no no plans for bringing some type of um, railroad thing on um, railroad uh, system here. You know, we don't have it. And also in the infrastructure, but I see that it is something that says something about um, Amtrak. You know, I, um, I think I think. Um, Sherry, no, you're probably the only person I know who's been in the general assembly longer than I have. But at any rate, I started as a child. <laughs> <laughs> she was there when I got it. But, anyway, but we've talked about mass transit for years, and you might want to we expand have. on or expound on some of those uh, initiatives in the past. Right. And, and just one thing, because I know when uh, Ken Alexander ran, you know, and we was getting those uh, tunnels together, we were trying to figure out, hey, you know, why wasn't it tied uh, implemented into building those new tunnels? So, you know, that could have well, joined the two some, There were some now. localities that didn't want people from Portsmouth going through. I got it. Sherry, you might want to speak to that because that <laughs> on camera, right? <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Meg Lover. Absolutely. Councilman Woodard. Um, Senator Lucas. Um, I think, uh, just off the top of my head, one of the issues you're going to have with the tracks is that we don't own the tracks, and neither does the state. They're owned by the railroad companies, the coal companies. Um, so any usage of them would have to be done in cons consolidation with them. Um, as far as the, we tried to, when the tunnel project was in place, there was an uh, effort in, on the foot to try to get uh, something to come through there to bring the light rail through, to bring it on this side. It was determined by the engineers who were working on the project at the time that it wasn't cost effective to do that. So rather than do that, they put a little extra money in it to the side to provide for a bus service to go through there to take people from point A to point B through the tunnel. Um, the water, transgressing the water is a big issue here and it costs a lot of money to do that. So at the time when they were developing these projects, they didn't see, that they, the, the funding wasn't there to do anything of that nature. Um, Amtrak, you know, the big push has been to try to get a second train from here to Richmond, Richmond to D.C. So they're looking at the larger corridors that's going to provide the um, usage to make it profitable. You have to have a return on your investment, ROI. So it costs money to do these things, and then you have to make sure that you've got um, the service, the people to, to actually participate in it to make it worth the while. So um, I don't know if that answers your question all of the way. We're but less with the water in one way, but when it comes to those, to mass transit, th there are some restrictions. Yeah, we've also, there's been considerations about bringing back a ferry service. Mm -hmm. At one time, there was a, a whole issue about a fast ferry and um, to come to between the different cities to try to free up some of the 
congestion on the roads. And um, it was looked at, it was talked about, but then it didn't occur. Right. So, well, and, and just one thing, you know, I, I know we all speak about the tunnel, you know, uh, the light rail through the tunnel, but I'm really, you know, interested in just trying to tie the two businesses together. You know, in, within Portsmouth. That's, that's the main thing. That could be a start for us. And I just say, in, in Norfolk, light rail costs $43 million per mile. So you might want to think about right. do that math then. $43 million per mile. So you might want to do that math. Mm. That's that's what they that's what they yeah so yeah you work right. on that when y'all when y'all close <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's practical when, it's practical when you're working on land versus trying to get around water right right well well that's what I'm doing you know just trying to get the two business issues together that's that's initially you know what I'm what I'm talking about when so I'm about three four five miles away yeah so about two hundred million you got mm -hmm. that <laughs> <laughs> that's a lofty goal. <laughs> Mayor. Ms. Neal, um, one of the things I wanted to share with my council, um, first of all, I want to thank our delegation from the state uh, for all of the work that they do. Uh, you know, we're going to be cutting a ribbon for a casino on December 7th. Mm -hmm. That took and that's, 22 years to happen. Right. I was getting, I was getting ready to go there, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the tenacity and the perseverance and the commitment and the level of leadership from our own Senator L. Louise Lucas. Yeah. And, and you know, you have to be a visionary, but it takes time. And a lot of times, you know, that's what we have to do. So I'm grateful for their leadership, particularly at this time of year at Thanksgiving. I did want to say I attended the congressional delegation luncheon yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the representation of Congressman Scott, Loria Whitman, and Congressman McEachin. To Senator Lucas's point, at the federal level, they understand the need for additional child care dollars, and we are hoping that something from a federal level comes in addition to what you may do at the state. Uh, that's very critical, and education and workforce. Those areas, of course, I think Congressman Scott chairs those committees. Uh, is very important, and that was very evident at the meeting yesterday. So. He chairs the same committee in Congress that I share in the state. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So we're hopeful, and I thank you all for your optimism and for everything that you have put in in the work on Portsmouth, and I share your sentiments. You know, we're on the rise. Yes, you know, sir. our stock is going up, mm -hmm. and that's what we've got to continue to promote. We've got to work with our state delegation and our, our city leadership to make sure that we're working together to continue that upward trajectory. So thank you all. Um, if there are no other questions, happy Thanksgiving, and uh, we appreciate all that you do. Does that mean you want us to take our leave now? <laughs> no, ma'am. No, no, no. Say yes. <laughs> May I say one thing, Mayor, you before, be part, no. before you part? I just wanted to thank our delegation members for your support of the package. I have the information about who's going to going to patron what bills, and everything's been covered. It looks so, like I'm carrying all the money bills. You, you, you the money lady. <laughs> but we really thank you guys for your support and look forward to working with you in the upcoming General Assembly it's session. It's my pleasure because this is the home of my birth and I will be working for Portsmouth until I die. Yeah, appreciate that. And Miss Neal, thank you, ma'am, for all of your hard work. I've seen you up there at the General Assembly running through the halls and up and down the stairs and we're glad that you're on our team. Thank you for the support of council for all the years, that 17 years as of the first of this month. So I thank council for all their support, and of course our city manager has been fabulous, so thank you. Thank you. And our city attorney. Thank you. Yeah, because they're first day bills. So they have to go in right away. Yeah, and Delegate Scott has a proposal on the House side. Do you need a resolution from us and council? I can just leave it to me, but I need a resolution tonight. Yeah, to go to a doctor, definitely. Business, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate you. Oh, yeah. So, y'all, so, right. so, so, will, uh, will you send the resolutions? Can we talk about this later? Yeah.
now. Spread out. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're going to go in there? We're staying in here. Oh, I don't know. Oh, we were staying in here. We were just spreading out. Yeah, okay. Because we're not. Yeah, I think we are. We're going to stay in here. That's what I thought. Oh, yeah. They just spread out a little bit. You know what? Yeah. You know, I hate to. Well, I, I see what I go. do to her, you know? There you go. There you go. There you, go. Yeah. you got it back. Uh, you got it back. Oh, man. So, the education money can be spread on the way out. They get a load of me. Mm -hmm. You got it. Uh, yes. Madam Manager? Oh, sorry. You have the floor. Ma as a follow up to the recent discussions with City Council on ARPA funding, especially as it relates to public utilities, our next presentation is from the City's financial advisor, Davenport and Company. David Rose, Senior Vice President and Manager of Public Finance, is here to present a utility fund ARPA update and we'll take questions at your convenience. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, Rose, I have hard you. copies of this um, under the thought that maybe the machine wouldn't work, and mm -hmm. since I brought the copies, the machine does work. So <laughs> we can always, uh, let me give it to you. Exactly. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. They have it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, what I'd like to do tonight um, is to address uh, what we were asked to present tonight, which was a little bit of a recap on where you stand as it relates to the Utility Enterprise Fund, which those of you know, it's the water and sewer system. And so that is a system that you have managed well as it relates to keying separate from the general fund, uh, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have some challenges, uh, and we're going to talk about that. And, you know, I'm going to just tell it like it is. Um, this system, as uh, Senator Lucas indicated or someone had indicated, uh, is old, and it's old because the city has got a whole lot of tradition and character and uh, wonderful architecture, but it also has old pipes. And, uh, with all of those things, some hundred plus years old, uh, comes maintenance and repair, uh, and we need to pay for that. We're going to talk about that tonight. So one of the things I was asked to look at is whether or not uh, there was going to be a material impact on using about eight and a half million dollars of the ARPA funds towards utility enterprise capital needs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight and hopefully also give you a large your perspective. Um, as uh, it was indicated earlier, you're going to get close to $60 million in ARPA funds over the next two uh, fiscal years. So, as I indicated, uh, the Enterprise Fund is self-supporting. Uh, that is the way of best practices. I want to continue to do that because if it stays self-supporting, it keeps the pressure off the general fund. By keeping pressure off the general fund, uh, it minimizes the pressure on the taxpayers as it relates to property taxes and those things. So, again, there's no free lunch here, uh, but it is one of the ways in which we try to keep the pressure off the general fund. Um, having said that, um, the enterprise fund can and does issue what we call revenue bonds, and those are bonds that are paid exclusively from the user fees. And what's important about that is it allows the city's general fund not to have to count the debt against the general fund. And again, that's in part why, and again, I think Mr. Battle said that and some others, the city does have a very good credit standing. You have an excellent credit rating, or ratings, I should say, uh, which means that you're in solid shape. Doesn't mean you don't have challenges, as we've talked about before. But again, the city is in solid shape financially. Uh, but with that being in solid shape, takes certain expectations. And some of those expectations are meeting a variety of debt covenants. And I will tell you, COVID has not done you any favors with regard to the user funds, with regard to some of 
those debt covenants. We're going to talk about that. And hopefully that will change over the next six to nine months to a year. But we're going to talk about what it has meant to have this COVID impact. Lastly, um, the city's enterprise fund has about 130 or so million dollars outstanding. That is broken up into some general obligation bonds, but those are self-supporting. And what I mean by that is, as a result, they don't count against the general obligation bonds in terms of being credited against you from the rating agencies. Because again, they are backed up by the general obligation, but they don't need the general obligation because the user fees are paying for that. And that's what we want to do. Yes, Dr. Redeker. When you're saying they're backed up by general obligation, you're referring to the general fund? I'm referring to not only the general fund, but all of the revenues of the city and all the wherewithal of the city uh, is what is the backing for that, but the actual dollars are the user fees. Yes, sir. So as a result, what's happened is we have really excellent interest rates on those bonds. Doesn't mean we can't refinance them if rates come down or we get closer to maturity, but as a result, those bonds are literally right there a step away from AAA rates because of the way it's set up. And so you've been in that good shape. And again, we've seen that. We've talked to you about and done some refundings, all because the credit rating of the city is excellent. And again, your interest rates have been very solid. Okay. So with that said, um, here's, the, here's the struggle, here's the challenge, and that is in your existing five-year capital improvement program that you passed, on the utility side alone, you've identified some $180 million of borrowing. $180 million, that's what you've identified. On top of that, even before that, you've identified and have outstanding authorized but not issued about $160 million of debt. So remember what I said earlier, we have basically about $130 million already that's been borrowed, but we literally have two, three times that that could be borrowed. But again, the affordability there is a real challenge, and we're going to talk about that. So instead of talking about it, I thought I'd show it to you graphically. If I could, if I could just walk over here, is that right? Is that just, sure. Okay. So this dark green is that 130 million or so. That's your existing debt service. That's what's being paid for by your user fees, and that is about 11 million dollars in this year's budget. If we were to add on 180 million not even the unauthorized part, just the 180 million that's been identified. And I'm gonna to get to that in a minute, why we're not talking about the 160 yet. It doubles, it goes up to some $22 million. That's just not affordable. That's just not affordable. So having said that, part of what we've been working with your staff over the last couple of months is how do we not have something like that occur and at the same time, how do we take care of absolute needs? And I'm going to talk about that in a couple minutes, if I could. So, a couple more pieces here. In 2019, as part of that dark green, we did about $30 million of bonds. So we did some debt. And that, again, those are being paid for by the user fees. We also talked at that time about needing absolutely ongoing at least 5% annual rate increases. Again, you know me, I'm not here always to tell you what's popular, but I've got to tell you what's necessary. And we saw that it was at least 5%. And that was 5% based upon that third bullet point, and that was some budgeted 22 revenues, FY22, being where the rate consultants, I'm not your rate consultant, of course, thought you'd be. But because of COVID, right now, we are basically $4 million below that budget. Yes, Mr. Bow. So in essence, what you have said thus far is we have $160 million worth of bonds that we are handling adequately. 
but handling exactly. adequately. Uh, maybe a little less than that. I think it's 100, whatever. I'll get the number. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Yes, right. 130. Right. I think it's 130. I'll tell you right now. 130. 130. Yes. And now yeah. you're saying there's a 180 million potentially in the next five years, and you don't know at which point it's going to spin and and to and need to enforce on us a need where we would have to double what we're paying, which is 11 million a year, to 22 million. Right. Oh, okay. Right. All things being equal, if we don't do anything strategic or creative, think about it a little differently, that's correct. It could be, it could look something like that. Right. All right. And the bill that's been passed by the federal government won't impact this. Well, the bill that's been passed potentially could help a little bit. And that's one of the things I'm going to list is one of the things we're going to talk about. So you're you're thinking on the ways I'm, I'm sort of moving okay. in that direction. I just don't Absolutely. want you to lose. Okay. All right. So you may say, what's that $4 million? So that little parenthetical there is our budget back in 2019 thought we'd have about $47 million of revenues. So we end up having about $43 million. So think of it as about 10% below mm. what was planned by virtue of COVID. All right. So one of the things to add to your point, Mr. Battle, is we are hopeful that you're going to pop back up and get back to what was your estimates by the consultant. If you do that, that's going to play a big impact in cash flows and the ability to service that kind of debt. Okay. So that's going to be important to do that. So what yeah. put us there? Well, with COVID, it sounded to me like COVID oh, was your, okay. was your, you know, and you're not alone. I mean, you're, you know, again, we go, it's just the way it is. All right. So as a result, the important thing is we are now not meeting all of the financial covenants as it relates to being a true enterprise fund. That's doesn't mean we're out of doesn't mean we're in default or anything like that. It just means that we have ourselves out of that whack and we got to get back into it. So one of the things we're going to talk about is if we could strategically use about eight and a half million dollars. We think that's going to help us. It's going to be an important piece of the pie, if you would. All right. So what we are understanding is that that $30 million has all been spent variety of projects. I don't pretend to know that, but I know staff does. But we also know that we were asked to look at what if we were to use eight and a half million towards the capital needs you have going forward. And so what we found is a couple things. Number one, even though we still have about a 30 or 35 million dollars of needs in the upcoming fiscal year, this will help us a little bit strategically, this eight and a half million. It allows us to replace and move some dollars around. So instead of going immediately, let's say from 11 million to 13 million in debt service, we can strategically use some of that eight million smartly and not put undue pressure on your overall rates. We're still gonna need every bit of 5% and then some, frankly. Right. We're gonna need even more than that. But we're going to minimize that hit if we can use that eight and a half million dollars. It's important. So one of the things we're going to be recommending in this little schedule, and I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes, is that with your blessing, council and mayor, I'd like to come back roughly about early March, which will be here before we know it. And as you're moving into the thick of your budget time, talk about what would be a strategy and what would be helpful to minimizing the needs of raising those rates. We're still going to need to do it, but hopefully not as much. And especially here where COVID is still hanging around and people are still struggling, we want to try to minimize that. But Mr. Rose, the 5%, that was that was a set amount. That was what we were going to do going forward regardless. Yes, sir. That's mm -hmm. just to keep up with the cost. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And that was before any of the meaningful dollars. And in fact, that rate consultant that was done, talked about doing between 9 and 13% right. for several years. That was the kind of number. 
but we knew that that's the kind of number that's just too large. It's not, it's not realistic. So part of my job is to try to see if we can't get closer to 5% and still responsibly take care of your absolute needs. So I'm going to talk to you about what we've been working with the city manager and all. Yes, sir. But is this an impact help now and a deeper hole in the future? No, 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 that, that's not what we're thinking about. I know what you're thinking. No, what we're thinking about, though, is to say if we can do rate increases and at the same time we can smartly borrow some of this money a little bit more strategically, um, there are some ways that we think we can get to, to get away from 11 to 13 percent. And this goes to that point, if there are some federal monies, and if indeed we get back to hopefully what I'll call more normalcy, which is that 47 million as a base of revenues right. versus the 43. Right. That's really, otherwise, had we had that 47, we would be in compliance with your policies, with your ratios. But again, well, no one foresaw in 2019 when you did this prior to COVID, mm -hmm. losing all of that kind of revenue for a while. Well, did we, do we see this necessity when we're doing the budget? Well, yes. You, so here's what I'm thinking. I'm um, saying in the past, yeah. have we allowed for this necessity? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Every, what we've done in previous budgets is I've come in front of you or I've worked with staff and we've said, okay, here's what you've told me you need as absolute needs. Here's the way to think about doing that. And here's what you need on rate increases, no matter what. So you've done that year in and year out. You've been doing that. But the cloud seems to get darker. Well, with all the intelligence that we throw in, in we're still seeming to be in a gloomy situation all the time. Well, I would say this. Um, again, you're in this position, you have old pipes, you have an older system, and it's been that way for years. It's not anything new. Well, can um, we make, make things simple? Like, we need 100 miles worth of piping done in the city. It costs X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, let's set the project up, a two, three year project, and, and, and alleviate the problem <coughs> rather than to keep well, again, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an engineer, so I can't answer that. But all that. these things have to be right. But they included. all have costs. They, they have they have several challenges. I'll, I'll just give you my perspective yeah. since I work with you and your neighbors yes. and many of them. So first thing you have is the reality of the dollars. Everything is much more expensive right now than it was a couple of years ago. It's just the nature of it. Second, and I think um, the, the delegation and y'all talked about it, the unemployment rate is literally record low and so people are working and so as a result uh, you know there's just not a lot of extra folks to go do some of these extra projects. That's one of the other challenges we see realistically and you know, you're ba basically when you or others, I say you, me and the local government, are trying to get a project done, we're seeing cost overruns because the subcontractors and whatever, they're bidding it up. I mean, that, we're seeing that. And as a result, everything's getting more expensive. So yes. I think that, I, that we can't help. All we can do is to say, okay, which we've been working with city manager and staff, is to say, okay, what do you absolutely need regulatory-wise to keep the pipes and things working and as a result of that what I'm in I'm hearing is we're going to need about 30 or 35 million dollars in the next maybe 12 to 15 months so that's part of our challenge and I'll get to that is to come to you and say all right how do we get some things done so as I said earlier that 180 million just to give you perspective if nothing changes we would need to basically see your user rates go up nearly 60 percent in five years. Wow. That's, that's the kind of numbers we're talking about. Wow. Okay. That's a lot. So ARPA funds could drop that down by 5 percent, maybe 10 percent, but still we're talking north of 50 percent. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Of course. Let's go ahead. Doctor. Yes, sir, doctor. I'm curious, why, why are we um, 
limiting this discussion to ARPA funding when we have an infrastructure bill that we have not yet realized? Because I'm not yet. I'm, I agree. It's a great question. We're not really limiting to ARPA, but what I'm saying is we only know for the moment I was given what ARPA dollars could be part of this equation. We don't know, you just said, what the infrastructure bill dollars could be, which is why what I'd like to do is once we do know what those infrastructure dollars are and what impact it could have, we're thinking that we'll have a better handle on that over the next couple, three months. And if we then do, that's why I'd like to come back roughly, as I said, early March with that piece of information in hand as well to talk about a strategy. So what I'm saying to you as a, as a, as a sort of this is a, how do I say, maybe a financial update is that we don't yet have a full strategy by any means. And that's, but what we do know is at the very least that eight and a half million could play a really important role. That, that's really one takeaway, I hope, Dr. Whitaker, is that one piece alone can be important. Right. Well, yeah. What initiated this uh, discussion was that we were looking at uh, the seawall project, which right. was 4.5, and mm -hmm. the water tank rehab. Right. And the issue was, are we going to use um, bond financing or are we going to use ARPA? And so the question was, what impact would using the bond financing have? And to answer that then, the answer I think is this, if we can use the ARPA monies strategically for those projects and freeze up some other dollars in the enterprise fund, that I think that will allow us then to borrow roughly 30 or 35 million dollars that's been identified for us without effectively, without effectively having that 11 million dollars pop up to let's say thirteen million dollars. So that's the impact. Right, so your graph yeah. your graph on um, page on page five. Yes sir. Right so there. That that red area right. although uh, your uh, what Y axis is showing the amount of debt. That red area um, you were mentioning hundred and eighty million. Yes, sir. But we're talking about 8.5 million. Right. So what? So here's why. Well, we at yeah. if 8.5. Because that, that, that 8.5, what it has the ability to do, um, right now, what you have is part of your ongoing capital improvements. You use about two million dollars a year of pay as you go. Think of it as cash flow. Okay. What we would do effectively is try to substitute. That 8.5 million could effectively be substituting that 2 million a year of cash flow, and that 2 million a year of cash flow could be leveraged to pay for about 30 million or so of your debt. That's how we think about it. So, so this whole thing would come down somewhat, but what would really happen is in the next few years, right here, these four years, we would not, on this first 30 million, I'm saying, we'd not basically have to put more pressure on the system. Now, I was thinking, with your blessing, to come back in March and give cash flows and show you all of that. It's just premature, but your questions are so good because you're seeing, okay, how does it fit in? That's, that's sort of how it's, it would preliminarily fit in. Now, having said that, if, if I could just, if I could move on this for a second, that's right, let me do that. I'm almost done, I promise. Okay, so what we said with council is if we came back in March, there's a variety of things we need to lock down, hammer around in the next basically 90 days. And one of those is we really need to work with your staff and understand what projects of that 180 are real and how much and how fast we have a problem and how much is it even cost for some of those. We have in the appendix a series of numbers that are not our numbers, but they're preliminary. And I'm not sure, I would defer to the city management here, how good they really are at this point, okay? And how, with the timing of it, what's the spending, what's the cash flows of all those? Second thing is we also really want to know in a post-COVID environment, are we going to get back to 47 million or not? Are we going to be permanently resetting the bar at 43 and then moving? 
And that, I can't answer that. That's going to have to come from the engineers and the folks that, you know, are tasked with doing that. The third thing is what you asked, I think, Mr. Battle, I think, Councilman Battle, you know, or maybe I think you did, Dr. Whitaker, um, impacts of grants as well as any of the federal monies from the infrastructure bill. That's got to be part of the equation. Now, the answer is that may be a very positive part of the equation, maybe nominal, but I want to know that before I go and make some recommendations that staff in turn makes to you all as you do your budget. So that's why I said that's going to be part of that equation, all those things. And then lastly, um, what we'd like to do is then be back with a revised plan for this in early March. I hope we can. That's the goal. Uh, I'm relying on some of the other folks, as is Angel here, on some of her staff people to give us some good stuff. It's only as good as we get in terms of what really it looks like. But if we get that, then we're going to recommend rate increases. I, I should say we're going to recommend what to be done. I can tell you, even before anything, even we get back to normalcy, we still know we need absolutely at least 5%. We just know that. And you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you like it is. It's just that's just the challenge that you've got because you've got so many needs. Well, we can't go up on those water rates. So they are already so we, we overburdened. So, so we can't really act on this 8.5 until you've assessed the impact of the infrastructure. I would say this. I would say because we know that your needs are so great, you could act on that 8.5 and not worry about it. Yes, sir, you could do that. Because that 8.5 is going to strategically be there, and I know that. So that, that, could, that could be on the bond side? Yes. Okay. Right. So I would say if you can use that 8.5 as the staff is hoping to use that towards capital, towards those capital projects that are identified, let's say cash-wise and all that, that again frees up that other cash that allows us to take care of the debt service on what inevitably be some 30 or 35 million of projects. And I don't know what those projects are. Uh, 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 just to make sure I'm clear, what, what I'm asking or, or getting clarification yes, on sir. is instead of using 8.5 of ARPA, mm -hmm. you can use 8.5 mm -hmm. of the utility bond. No, uh, actually what I'm thinking is if we use the 8.5 of ARPA, that'll help us towards getting more affordable utility bonds. That's what I'm sort of saying. I know it's a whole lot of, you know, step to step to step and, and all that, but it will make a huge difference. And then, and then, but that 30 million could only be used on utility projects. Yes, sir. We're only talking about utility projects. That's right. Only talking about that. Yeah, this is all only... Utility related, that's right. I haven't even talked about, we haven't even been asked yet to go into the, we'll call it the general fund side, which comes from, like you said earlier, all of the sources of the general fund. So, so, so if the infrastructure monies were to be able to uh, be allocated towards these projects, then that would have meant we could have allocated that 8.5 to, uh, of ARPA funding to other projects other than utility. Yeah, you know, CARPA though, what they've done, they've been very, very restrictive, unfortunately. You know, the federal government said water, sewer, and broadband. Right. So they're not letting you, like I think someone asked earlier about a transfer station or something like that. If it's not considered a utility transfer station, you know, then it, it's not allowed to be for ARPA dollars. It's not allowed. I, I said, it what's that? I wasn't asking for all of this. No, no, I'm saying, but, saying, but if it, but I'm just saying my, my point is, yeah, if it were considered in those categories, it could be used. If it's not, that's they're just very specific. That's all I'm saying. About those funds that were left at the end of all the allocations for right. the state. Right. That's the And that's different monies. I right. talking about different monies. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Sir. Madam Manager. Yes, just to clear up um, to Dr. Whitaker's um, point, the ARPA funds can be used for projects that are COVID related to the extent that we can justify that there is a benefit from COVID, um, we can use those funds. And we can use those funds for infrastructure projects if we're addressing some COVID relief or public health. 
us out. Uh, Councilwoman Lucasburg. Oh. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I mean, it's a, a big pill to try to swallow, but I think it's one that we need to learn how to digest uh, soon. Um, I attended the annual VML conference this year, um, Vice Mayor and myself. Uh, were there and we heard from a lot of the other lo lo localities that was receiving their ARPA funds, they're sinking their entire fund into their water sewer because they're not going to get an opportunity to see this big number uh, of cash flow again and a lot of them don't have the ability to go to the bond market to borrow money for those other infrastructure uh, projects. So I think that $8.5 million um, towards this is a, is a modest amount and we, we have to be able to look financially, fiscally smart um, at how we allocate it. So I appreciate the recommendation that you're giving us to try to understand this. And then I know some of the other localities, they only got or only received 10 million or 13 million and they're taking their whole 13 right. million because we all are older cities and we're all facing the same types of aging uh, water systems. So um, the broadband, the water systems, and definitely the, the COVID relief um, issues were ones that were told to us that we could use the ARPA fund. Yes. Uh, we do hope that the infrastructure bill will bring a similar amount so that we can uh, find some other ways to not mm -hmm. strain um, going to the bond market and, and you know changing our credit rating. Um, so. Um, I appreciate the information and hope that we can follow. Can I just piggyback just so what, what Absolutely, you know? sir. Then, Vice Mayor, you have the floor. So the, that, that was one of the issues, too, going to the bond market and impacting our credit rating. I haven't heard any discussion that if we were to do this, it would somehow be detrimental to our credit rating. Well, I think because if we do this in a measured way, like we're talking, I don't see it being detrimental to our credit rating. I think if you look at the way the city has operated, you've been structurally balanced, which is critical. You have solid reserves, which thanks to y'all's letting us keep those solid reserves, that's really been important because as you know, you've got more non-taxable real estate than anybody in the whole Commonwealth. And so as a result, that's your challenge. You can't change that. And so you've basically done what you can. And so it's why I said earlier that going and doing $180 million is not realistic. But if we could use some ARPA dollars, maybe get some of these infrastructure dollars, look at some grants that I know your staff is talking about applying to or having already applied to, and then also doing these projects in as much of a measured way as possible. I think then we've got that fighting chance. I think we're going to continue. And, and part of this is you're letting me be here tonight. And so you're all, like you said, it's a, it's a lot to swallow. Well, you're swallowing it starting now versus March, when all of a sudden you're about to do the budget in two weeks or three weeks. Now you're three months away from the budget, and we're starting to have these discussions. So I think that's also strategic in all this. It's important. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Vice Mayor Barnes, then Council. Councilman Moody and then Councilmember Battle. Well, I was actually going to ask what um, okay. Dr. Whitaker was saying, but kind of to go with something that you had said earlier about some of the localities mm -hmm. allocating their money toward these things. I think also some of those localities don't have some of the same issues that we have across the board. Right. And, and that's probably why, too, that they said they were doing those type of things. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> Councilmember Moody, then, then Mr. Battle, then we'll come back to you, sir. To uh, Dr. Whitaker's point, uh, I suggested that uh, David come and do the presentation because early on there was talk of uh, uh, going to the bond market to take care of some of these needs and using ARPA money elsewhere. Uh, uh, that was just part of our general discussion. So what you're saying, David, is if, if we stick to a plan and use uh, a modest portion of the ARPA money to address the substantial needs that we've got in the Asian water system, uh, then there's no threat basically to our bond rating. I can never say no threat, as you know. I'm not allowed to yeah. do that regulatory-wise, well, but I think that the, I, I think it's threat. minimal if, yeah. if Again, we, we stick to the policies and we will have to raise 
the rates again. I, I know we won't have to raise those rates, even if we did nothing, even if we did not borrow any money, just by virtue of that $4 million loss of revenues, we're going to have to stick with that 5% at least. I know that. Okay, and, I'm not, and I'm not your rate consultant, but I know. We don't know that. yet if that four million uh, dollar. Right, cap. we don't know that. That's right. So, shrink. right. So what I'm hoping is is that we get three more months of knowledge. You know, I say three: December, January, part of February. I'm a, hopefully, if, if you'll have me be here early March, it's up to the manager and all. And so basically, we'll have maybe it's really ten weeks from now, ten eleven weeks from now, more knowledge of how things are looking. And I'll know everything. In 10 weeks, I give you my word. I don't know everything. I, I, I'm not understanding why we can't connect the two together. Um, our engineers and and you. Oh, we can. We're going to do that. No, no, we're going to do that. No, no, I don't want you to wrong. No, okay. the the, ma the manager is is getting us. We're going to be doing that, uh, Mr. Battle. We're going to be doing that. We are. Dr. Whitaker, sir. Yeah. So. Will management be getting um, information to us? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know if it would be before the infrastructure discussion, but how how the initial discussion we were having as far as shifting some of these monies to uh, the recreation mm -hmm. programs, um, how will that look in line with what's being recommended? Are there funds there to shift towards um, the projects that? Uh, council had identified under the recreation programs, which I thought we were looking at shifting those funds. That to. that would be the council's determination if it's decided that we do not move forward on the utility-related infrastructure items to move those to the recreation projects to get those done. So, so based on the proposal, is it possible to do both? Based on. Based on what's being recommended. Um, oh, it, I mean, it, you don't have to answer the night. No, no, I, I just want to make sure I'm clear. When you're saying, is it possible to do both, to, to offset the debt mm -hmm. by the $2 million, use $8.5 million to offset the debt by $2 million a year, as well as fund the recreation programs? Right. Okay. Right. The, what, what is being recommended is that the uh, 8.5 of opera funds mm -hmm. be used. Right. That would free up funds to go out to get another 30 million mm -hmm. right. for utility okay. projects okay. and so I guess the question is where does that put the recreation money for these projects that we have listed here? Where would that come from? Okay. Let me report that back yeah. once, mm -hmm. once we because we're looking at some things and okay. we're gonna provide a report back okay. Okay. So I think this will help is, with that. So this is conjecture. This is a uh, uh, your forecast for the present. In March, we'll have exact numbers, exact forecasts. Okay. I would say we'll have a better, better. handle. Not exact. I, I will definitely not tell you going to have exact. No. Mm -hmm. We'll try to make this an exact science <laughs> because that's very important to be exact in what we do. Okay. To, yes. <laughs> to try to, we got to get a hold of this water. We can't raise the rates on our folk. They already pay an astronomical amount, but we got to get a hold on it. So we got to be at our best. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Manager, yes. Thank you. You, you had some more comments. And Mr. Rose, before you step down, yes, sir. Uh, before uh, I'd like the, the manager to make her comments, then I, I wanted to say something to you. Okay. I just wanted to add that um, staff, we're, we're looking at the numbers closely. A lot of the numbers have aged, you know, in terms of the projects, a number of the projects. Um, we just want to validate that the numbers we're seeing for a lot of those approved projects are still relevant today. Uh, so that's the first pass. And then after that, it's looking at what is required from a regulatory perspective and then what is required from a quality of life perspective. Now, I mentioned earlier in council meetings that staff has done a, a phenomenal job of getting grants. Uh, yeah. we, we continuously seek grants to address 
flooding to address stormwater issues, um, and we've been successful and we continue to do that. Um, so that's one of the, the areas that we're looking at. The infrastructure bill, we're tracking that. We're, we're trying to make sure that we know what's in that bill. And as soon as we get any indication of what that what's in that bill, then we're going to make sure that we convey that. Um, so we're looking across the board uh, in terms of the utilities, in terms of the projects, um, just to make sure that when we present them to you, they've been flushed out. Yes, ma'am. And hey, Mr. Rose, I um, yes, want to thank you on um, behalf of council for this in-depth presentation. A couple of things that, that just as a point of, of, of concern, you know, the, the raising of the rates, you know, having more debt to cover, raising the debt, the, the debt that we're having, you know, up from what we have today. So we expect and we look forward to getting the additional information so that it will help all of us make a better informed decision. But thank you and your firm for the work that you do on behalf of the city and happy Thanksgiving to you and your family, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We, uh, we I just, I'll use the word, we love working with the city. I do personally, I think it's a, it's an awesome place and um, I really appreciate you saying that. So thank you very much. Love coming. Thank you. And we do have a need to go into a closed session. And so we have a motion. Or do we have another pre report. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Sorry, Madam Manager. I didn't mean to. No, no. I'm sorry. No, we're sorry, Mr. No, no, he's talking about it. She, she has enough. You have some more city manager's report? Oh. You have some more. <laughs> well, in light of time, I mean, I was going to go through the city manager. Uh, report items just to make sure a summary just to see if there are questions so if i have time to do that I'm are, happy. i mean are we okay with her going through that report or do we need yes. the full time yeah. okay mm -hmm. go ahead so i go through pretty quickly the first item is the 4.8 that that you will see before you tonight that's the public safety funds for employees um the next items 45 um, 46,000. These are funds to assist in paying for records management systems and technology for the circuit court. Um, the next item is the $30,000 uh, funds received uh, to enable responsiveness for hazard materials for the fire department. One that I talked about earlier in terms of grants, 586,000. Uh, this will help um, to for critical assets and keep vulnerable communities dry by examining exposure to sea level rise, increased rainfalls, and impacts from tidal as part of our resiliency strategies. There is a $58,000 match, but we have, we have found that. Um, the next one is engineering. This is really uh, property transfer to enable design and install the sound barriers on I-264 to account for the traffic volume changes due to uh, elimination of the tolls from MLK portion. So, item 21-356. Yes, sir. So when you see this amount, 527000 coming for drainage and street improvements, so where is that drainage and street improvement occurring? Um, I can give you the specifics on that. I can give a report back on and, how and then, that's going to be used. And then does that decrease the uh, public utility expense overall for, to, for projects is correct this, was this, this something that was once a considered a project that now we have grant funding for it could be okay i, I need to review it because it, it's possible that it's something new okay um because i'm not sure how dated the information is that we're looking at okay but i can look at that and make sure to report back on exactly what this is covering okay And so the next item is uh, the Portsmouth Redevelopment Housing Authority. They're asking for um, this uh, approved NHT community nonprofit entity to the ability to perform renovations, kitchen bathrooms, lighting, et cetera. They're asking for bonds. This is no, um, the city would not be liable for these at all. And then the next social services, uh, this item's to approve continuation for the direct lease um, for the Portsmouth Health Department. And basically it will ensure that Portsmouth Health Department is, is has we have access in the building. 
And then the last is the what you just heard from our state delegation is to approve the adopted 2022 state and federal initiatives legislative package. I went through those pretty quickly, but yes, other questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We do have a need uh, for uh, closed session. Do you all read the motion, Vice Mayor? I move to go into a closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711A1 for the purpose of discussing or considering appointments to boards and commissions and the position of city attorney. Second. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Barnes? Yes. Mr. Battle? Yes. Mrs. Lucas Burke? Yes. Mr. Moody? Yes. Dr. Whitaker? Yes, yes. Mr. Woodard? Yes. Mayor Glover? Yes. Yeah. We're in close. If we could just take a minute. Requirements under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed you meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting just concluded. Second. We need a roll call. I need the clerk. Please, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Sure. <laughs> Mr. Bars. No way either. No. Mr. Battle? No. Mrs. Lucas Burke? No. Mr. Moody? What were we what are we doing now? I don't Take know. I'm scared to ask. Yes. <laughs> Y'all are certifying closed session. Okay. Right. You're a yes? Oh yes. Dr. Whitaker? No. Okay. Mr. Woodard? No. Mayor Glover? Yes. Okay, thank you. 